Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Let me introduce you your host for today, and his name is Kai from Workwell. Kai, the mic is yours. Thanks, Leslie, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kai from Workwell. Uh, we are a personalized uh, workplace wellness strategies consultant uh, focused on helping you keep your employees happy and healthy. And uh, we'd like to actually also thank our partner, Jasco, uh, for this webinar. Jasco is currently Singapore's uh, leading co-working space provider uh, with more than 40 centers across eight cities in Asia Pacific, including presence in Indonesia, uh, Thailand, and China, to name a few. So to know more about Jasco, you may check out their website and social media page. So we are finally at the finale of our three-part webinar series on uh, dog behavior and training with Ethan. And uh, on behalf of my team, to all the returning attendees from all the previous sessions, we really appreciate your participation throughout our series. Uh, and if you are joining us for the first time, we just like to shout out a big thank you, uh, you know, for taking your time out to join us today during this long weekend. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, should you like to catch up, you know, to speed with uh, Ethan's sharings from previous sessions, good news, uh, they have been uploaded to our workwell.sg Facebook page. Uh, our page handle is up here. All right. So after today, you may watch them. Just click on the video section of our page. Um, and also, yeah, uh, we're very excited to uh, bring on Ethan to come on very, very shortly. Uh, but just to quickly lay out the outline of our webinar today for the first part of our webinar, uh, we will be learning about how to transit our dogs uh, to, to the new normal and reintegrating back uh, socially with their friends, followed by a QA and a session where you may engage with Ethan, you know, should you actually have any specific questions about your pet dog. So please feel free to type any questions you have in the Q&A section, uh, and then we will go through them later. And yes, today's webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to our page. So you should be able to, you know, rewatch today's session uh, next week. Uh, lastly, before we actually bring on Ethan, uh, as always, we would like to in, uh, invite our live participant. She's none other than our director from Workwell, uh, Kimi. Hi, <laughs> Hello, Kimi. everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Taco is having a nap now, so maybe he'll come on later. Maybe, yeah. Su surprise yeah. us later. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yep. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, everyone, please join me along with your pets and welcome Ethan. The stage is yours. Hello. <laughs> Hello. The Hi. host. Ah, okay. Hello. All right. Now we see you. Yes. Hi. Welcome to the finale of our three part webinar series. Yay. Um, Yay. Yeah. So, uh, just a quick uh, run through of what we are going to be doing today. I actually, as you can tell, there's no poll being done today. As, um, which is different from the other sessions because today I don't want to be the one asking the questions I want you guys to be asking questions which is why I'm going to allot like the about three quarters of these sessions to answering questions as well um, but having said that I'm going to jump straight in into today's uh, topic which is the, the subject is keep calm and move on so it's something that we we see quite often you know the sign and uh which and it's also something which is very much needed now in this COVID pandemic situation that we have. Um, but I know that majority of our viewers have already moved on from uh, phase one, which is the really um, strict lockdown. And your dogs have actually also somewhat transited to your new routine. Um, whether some of them, are, some of the owners are working from home all the way or they're doing two weeks at home, two weeks in the office, or some, something like uh, um, more time at home, or it's just something that's different from your original routines. Um, so which I'm not going to talk too much about how do you transit out of the circuit breaker period because we have already uh, moved on to phase two. And I, I do know that a lot of our dogs have already started to reintegrate into the society um, in the, in, in the dog sense, la, their society, which is their pack, uh, meeting old friends again, going to dog parks, going to dog cafes again, uh, which is which something, it's something that you've missed during the CB period. But if you have questions about that, 
specifically um, in some of the challenges that you have been facing so far, do voice it out, you know, uh, type it out in the live chat and I'm sure the moderators are going to be able to um, see it. Did I just got yes, you? Yes, Ethan, you yeah. just muted yourself. Now okay? <laughs> yep. Okay, sorry about that. All good, all good. So, we're going to talk about transitions in the first place. Um, in terms of, in general, transitions happen all the time. Think about it. Your dog's life when um, they were first brought into your home, there was a big transition already. Um, and I'm sure many of you, even though you've not gone through any form of training, you've successfully transited or you've um, already done the transition. Whether or not it was done well was probably due to how it was being handled at that time, right? Us as trainers, we also do a lot of transitional, transitioning work for our dogs, whether it is with regards to moving, helping my clients move to a new place or helping my client's dog um, adapt to a place, that, an environment which is different which the dog would otherwise have had always a lot of negative associations with. For example, if I have a client whose dog is insecure, then the transition that I would like to help that client with would be the transition to, a, to an environment whereby there are a lot of such dogs that they are fearful or insecure with. Likewise, if I have a dog who is overexcited um, and, and is having a lot of problems dealing with um, dogs barking at, at, at him. So that dog, that overexcited dog, is going to re, uh, reflect and be triggered easily by barking dogs as well. So having that, um, having an owner have a plan for transition is very important. So which is why I want to introduce you guys to the concept that transitions, um, there are only two types. Firstly, you can do it through slow progressions. And secondly, you can go cold turkey. Yeah. There are pros and cons to each of these approaches. So um, those people who have experience um, from transitioning from phase one to phase two of the circuit breaker, right? Um, those of you who have done straight away going back to the office, you've experienced cold turkey. Those of you who have experiencing um, the, the, the two, two weeks at home, two weeks and in the office, you guys are putting your dogs through slow progressions as well. And I remember during the first part of the series, there was one person that asked, how do I um, train separation anxiety for my dog? Or train my dog out of separation anxiety? I actually introduced a slow progressive method, which was five minutes away from your dog, and then after that, progress on to 10 minutes and so forth. Right? So let's talk about the cold turkey approach first. That's actually a technique in which I use a lot when I want to introduce dogs to new things. I use that purely because I don't have the luxury of time like my owners or like my clients, right? A lot of dog owners, they have the luxury of time to actually do slow progressive work when they're doing transitions. For example, if you know that you're going to transit into phase two or phase three of working in the office, then you should really start your slow progressions one week before you actually go to the office. And there are clients who are also moving from this country to another country or, or, or vice versa, and they are asking, how do I introduce the dog to the crate? Now, if they're short on time, then obviously I have to go to cold turkey. So an example would be, if I were to introduce a dog to a crate, right? cold turkey would look like this. I'll put a leash on, I will guide the dog into the crate, into first, and then I will reward with food. So the reinforcement is at the end. Now, if I were to do slow progressive methods, then that's the, that's the one whereby you slowly place food closer and closer to the crate and then have the dog eat inside the crate. And then from then on, you close the crate and then you make sure that the association is positive, remains positive. So these two approaches. Now, the effect on the dog is also different. Cold turkey, you tend to compound the stress or the discomfort at the beginning, yeah? So when I bring a dog into a crate and the dog is totally not, uh, uh, is totally new to the crate, so the discomfort or the, the suspicion 
or the insecurity of going into the crate is compounded mm -hmm. right at the beginning because I'm leashing the dog and bringing the dog in. Whereas for slow progressions, you're spreading out the stress. You're spreading out the discomfort. So that gives you um, the, the luxury of, of doing it slowly and having your dog be desensitized to it. Right? Because then you have you can do it in stages. Whereas for for um, cold turkey, you are actually just counter conditioning. Put you in a crate and then I give you the treat. Now it will not work for soft dogs, soft gentle dogs. Soft gentle dogs, you will have to do the slow progressive methods. Mm -hmm. Whereas for cold turkey, if you have a hardy dog, you should go cold turkey for your dog. But having said that, I have also done cold turkey uh, transitions for soft gentle dogs. Plainly also because I need to show my clients that it is possible first, right? And I do have to regulate the amount of stress that the dog is going through because it is quite a big jump. So if you're looking at transitioning from um, working from home to your office, you have to look at the character of your dog. Whether your dog, and you have to look at the starting point, whether your dog is okay um, being in alone at home first and for how long. Because if you don't have that starting point, then you don't know what is the end goal. Yeah? So, to, to also give you guys a better idea of this whole three, uh, the flow of these three series, right? I'm going to go back a little bit onto the first webinar for the, the benefit of those who have not uh, attended the first two seminars as well. So, the first webinar was really about introducing you guys to the concept that you need to recognize change when there is change in your dog. So changes would be, uh, we've talked about the energy of your dog from being uh, high energy to suddenly becoming frustrated. Or we've talked about like low energy dogs suddenly displaying signs of boredom. Yeah. And recognizing is the first step, which is why we, we went into talking about the need to address uh, certain situations. So therefore, part two of our webinar was about how do we um, help our dogs cope, right? So we talked about house rules as well as um, the tricks and commands. Tricks and commands to entertain our dogs, whereas house rules to keep our dogs disciplined, structured, and balanced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then now we're talking about transitioning into the new um, uh, routines. So a lot of us, Actually, we still don't know what is the, the routine going forward. But I want you guys to be able to at least understand that there are two kinds of transitions. You can either go cold turkey or slow progressions. Now, I have a lot of examples that I can give, but I think it's best that you guys, bearing these two concepts in mind, um, if you want to know how to transit, for example, your dog with a specific, specific issue, or with an issue that the dog has developed during the circuit breaker, right? And what kind of approach might be better for your dog? You can go ahead and ask me. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think um, I would like to go into a lot of details other than when the questions come from the audience. <laughs> yeah. So, Kimi, you, you yourself, do you have any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At this moment, not yet, but I have started to do uh, what you what you mentioned the previous time. Uh, I think mm -hmm. I'm really going on to progression. Mm -hmm. uh, that means uh, starting to go out a bit more often, like at least every two, three days or so, I'll leave taco at home for... Mm -hmm. Start from like a half an hour, then an hour, two hour, three hours. Because okay. eventually, if let's say uh, I'll be back at work, sometimes he can be left at home between six to eight hours. So that's oh. what I'm a bit more concerned. Then at this moment, everything seems fine. I don't really hear him barking mm. uh, loud, you know, when I'm on my way back. But I got to be very careful because uh, he recognized my car. And because my mm -hmm. house is on the first floor, he can hear my car. Yeah. So he will always bark. So yeah, I mean, I try to go out by, by foot and I come back and to see mm -hmm. whether he bark. But I realized something that uh, at this moment, he's not really peeing well on the mm -hmm. pee tray. 
Okay. So, uh, a bit near the picture, but you know, quite a few times I peed outside. Okay. But I guess it, that one might be a separate well, issue. Um, so it, it, I mean, it can be linked to the fact that um, things have been unstable for the past two to three months because the routine is yeah. different, the rituals are different. So it could be linked to that. But I'm saying it's a separate issue because then um, to to help your dog remember the structure that he had, right? Mm -hmm. I'll go back to your house rule. So the house rule of being um, understanding where he should be peeing. So you might need to do a little bit of confinement when you're away. Oh, okay. So that he remembers because during CB, right, he transited. What was the transition there? He transited into a an environment which was freer, whereby he had a lot of time with the owner. Okay. Right? Okay. As opposed to when before Circuit Breaker, he had to rely on his memory of mm. the house room. Okay. He had to rely on what he knew or he learned before. So he's practicing uh, the observance of that house rule when you're not away. Okay. So now so he... when you leave, right, mm -hmm. he might have forgotten how to practice observing the house rule. So you know to help him, you might need to lessen his chances of performing a mistake. Okay. But he was yeah. he was okay when I'm at home though. That means mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, he yeah. yellow. So Yeah. Be, He's okay when you're at home because you are there and you actually remind him of the house rule. Oh, so I, yeah. I remind him of the house rule. So if I yeah, leave because home... Because he associates the, the house rule when you with are with you when you're around. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. But he, he didn't get to practice it when you are away because you're, you're hardly away during circuit breaker. Okay. Right. Mm, so, mm. okay, so that is going to be... Okay. Yeah, that's, then, that's something which is very common because a lot of people when they stay at home a lot mm -hmm. they tend to become a little bit more relaxed about certain things whether it is about house rules or whether it's about the relationship with the dog so mm -hmm. sometimes because yeah because they're at home right they don't need the dog to be so responsive because they can always they can always see the dog they can always, yeah then they don't go out to practice you know off leash control or in fact, they are exposed to less and less situations. I yeah, see. so it's almost like how I uh, did not manage to practice my Mandarin, and it all just went out the window. Yeah, okay. but if I was forced to live in China, right? Then yes, my Mandarin will still be there. I'll retain that knowledge. Okay. Right? Yeah, so that I will be able to um, remind myself how to use. So oh. that's what I think that's what Taco lacked. Yeah. I see, I see. I mean, that's yeah. what I have been um, trying to practice and I have to keep reminding myself of uh, don't make the walk a toilet walk like what you have mentioned. Yeah. It's very yeah. tempting right. because uh, when I make sure that he does his business outside, then, you know, he won't do it at home. But mm -hmm. I have to keep reminding myself that, you know, hey, the walks are not meant to be toilet walks yeah. because, yeah, one thing that I'm very concerned is that you know, if he's going to hold his bladder and wait until that I come back and I walk in, that's going to be mm -hmm. very detrimental to his, um, yeah, his, his health mm -hmm. and stuff. That's why I'm very worried. Then, okay. Um, okay. So, but one thing I want to assure you as well as uh, our other viewers, right, is that mm -hmm. regardless of the type of transition that you do, whether it's cold turkey or slow progressions, right, mm -hmm. we do have to remember that our dogs are extremely adaptable. And I would use the example that I always use um, back in the my canine police canine days, right? Mm -hmm. The working dogs that we had. I mean, they are a different class, right? Working breed, uh, mm -hmm. German Shepherds as well as Labradors and Cocker Spaniels. Yeah. But um, they have to, after two years being attached to a handler, they have to be able to transit into a new owner okay. or a new handler. Yeah, yeah, because the rotation for our NS is two years. Mm -hmm. So our dogs do have to go through that kind of transition. And the surprising thing is that they say that, yes, the dogs 
uh, they might only be loyal to one or two people yeah. in their lives. Um, but when the transition is done right and the bonding is, is, is in place, you'll find that dogs, they are highly adaptable. They will not only remember their previous handler, but they will be loyal to both handlers and they, yeah, they will adapt to your style of communication. They will adapt to your style of uh, walking them as well. So that's I, something which I want a lot of people to bear in mind because they're always quite afraid to make changes for their dogs. But to begin with, your dog is going through huge changes in their lives. From the time it was be, is being born to the time that it's separated from uh, his or her little mates to the time in which he's brought into a different environment um, mm-hmm. that is not, yeah. So even if you're, whether you're rescuing a dog, um, transitioning from a natural habitat um, be, you know, vegetation kind of environment to an urban environment or whether you're buying a dog from, from a, a reputable breeder, you know, these are all transitions and the, the dogs, that's why they, I feel that a lot of them can fly and go into a different country and still be able to adapt and love the family that they end up with. What's the number one tips that, you know, okay, so I'm going to guide him through yes. a transition uh, um, what's the very very mm. first thing that we have to oh. that, that okay. yeah, correct. So, uh, so I'll talk about uh, cold turkey first because cold mm. turkey is the most straightforward mm. so if you're doing cold turkey for your dog if you are very gentle and you're not firm okay. right, your style if your style is not firm then you will uh you will experience a, if if you're not firm, then you will experience a lot of difficulties because you are you you might not be <laughs> following through one hundred percent. Because a cold turkey means you have to follow through. You have to do what is the objective a hundred percent. Okay. Right? The dog might be stressed, right? But you have to bear in mind that the stress is at the beginning because you're compounding the stress, and mm-hmm. then you're waiting until you've done the objective for the dog to process and figure out so for if you want to go cold turkey you have to be uh mentally prepared first to be a okay. bit more uh rigid I okay? see. whereas for slow progressions mm-hmm. i always tell my owners that you have to be very patient why because slow progressions means that you're not stressing the dog too much okay. but at the same time the dog won't give you as much so your expectations have to be lowered you understand? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, like for example, yesterday I was I, I was training a, a client to walk um, the dog in a certain direction. So the okay. dog comes out from a condo, doesn't uh-huh. want to turn, uh, only likes to turn left, doesn't want to oh. walk right because of some negative association that it that developed during the younger years. Mm-hmm. So my style was cold turkey. So when I walked, I took over the dog, right? I knew in my mind, I formed the intention that I was going to complete walking to the right side all the way until the dog relaxes. So even though the dog is resisting, I'm not dragging the dog, but I am pulling just enough for him to take the steps to walk to the right side. So I completed it within 45 steps. I counted. 45 steps. Yeah, that was the cold turkey approach. So I told the owner, why don't you try the cold turkey approach? just walk like I did, right? But <laughs> most of the time, uh, the owners, they might be a little bit uh, too gentle or too soft or they feel um, sorry for the dog. So this owner walked 45 steps and then at the most crucial time, she slowed down. And then I counted. She had to continue on for up to 100 steps until the dog relaxed and moved with her. So the okay. first thing that I wanted to show her was that it's not impossible to walk that in, in the right direction, in the right okay. side. Yeah? yeah, It's a matter of how you do it. So if okay. I was, if, if a person like me was firm and I walked, I only needed 45 steps, whereas she needed 100 steps. Yeah? But at least we've established the, the um, starting standard, like the benchmark. Right? I, see, yeah? I see. So then... I realized that, yeah, she, she's, she's not uh, firm enough to, to do it such that the dog will, will understand um, that is the objective, walking right down that street. 
right? Okay. So eventually, if I were to foresee if she's going to continue without me, she might even take more than 100 steps to walk. Okay. So therefore, I told her to do the slow progressive approach, which is to walk slower. Yeah? But you cannot expect 100 steps to be your benchmark. Your dog might need more than that. <laughs> yeah. I so that. then also, when it comes to tracking progress in that mm -hmm. dog, she can't say that, oh, I expect my dog to do 50 steps with me today and then relax. No. she probably need to do, you know, yesterday 100. Today, she probably need to do about 89 steps okay. in order for her to get the dog walking. Okay. To me, if you're taking that slow, progressive uh, transition approach, then yes, that's a big win already. Okay. If you're taking that slow, progressive approach. Okay. But if I were to go cold turkey, I would expect it to be faster. I yeah. see. So there are different expectations and there are different approaches when you do this kind of transitions. Yeah. Okay. Of course, circuit breaker and phase, all these phases, uh, it tells us that the government is also doing the slow progression. But for our dogs, we have to question how are we doing it for them. Okay, I yeah. see, I see. Okay, so, I can see that. Yeah, I want to hear what uh, some of our viewers are yeah. saying. Yes, uh, Ethan, uh, oh. I think since you're talking about uh, during this circuit breaker, you know, and, and reopening all that, Lily Chua mm -hmm. asked, uh, yes. During COVID, right, uh, she and the family had uh, many deliveries from online shopping. Uh. Ah, yes. just like many of us so when there is someone at the door he tends to dash towards the door mm -hmm. uh, how to stop him mm -hmm. <laughs> can, is she live? Uh, can she be yes she's live yeah because uh, yeah. we just uh, enable her yes yeah because this one I need to understand so I think my specs are reflecting really you may feel free to yeah I think mm. I, I think she's She's unmuted already. Okay, yeah. so Lily, right? Yep. Is Hi. Lily there? Oh, yeah, she's there. Hi, Lily. Lily. Hello. No, no. Hello, hello. So I just want to understand. Um, right now, what is the procedure that you have in place? Because I need because um, if I were to recommend anything, you'd be going through a certain transition. Mm. So what is the structure that you have right now before you receive a delivery or before yeah, you receive uh, people at your dog? Where is your dog? He's always in the hall. Okay. He's always in the hall. Is he wandering? Wandering. So when the he, he, he knows that somebody's at the door. Yeah. And sit, so he'll, he'll start barking and dash towards the door. And then I will okay. go there. I'll go forward. I stop him, but he's still... Keep jumping and jumping and jumping and okay. continuously. Tell me, tell me how do you, because you said you tried to stop him, right? Yeah. Tell me how do you stop him? I block the, <laughs> the entrance. Uh. Mm -hmm. so I block him so that I can let the delivery guy put the parcel in the, in the, put the parcel down. Okay. So basically you hold him. Uh. You, yes, hold, you block him, you hold him. He's a bit um, smart, so when I block him at one corner, he mm -hmm. will go, he will dash in and out of the hall, and mm -hmm. then he notice that I move away, then he will sneak through the main door, and then he start barking at that poor delivery mm -hmm. guy. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm sure this problem didn't just occur during the circuit breaker, right? <laughs> a, few, a long time already. I tried More. to stop him, but I couldn't do it. Okay, so, so a dog trainer that came to help us with this. Uh -huh. When the dog trainer he he showed us how to do it. He mm -hmm. said you need to get him to give give a command, ask him to sit down. Mm -hmm. uh, so when but the he it works. It okay, works. but when you do it, but when I do it, I ask him to sit down. He just turn away. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So so you might need. So this is the structure that your dog has. The, this, let's talk about the old, old original structure first. Mm. The original structure is this sequence of events. I'm wondering, from your dog's perspective, I'm wandering around the house, suddenly somebody appears, I hear something or I sense something or I smell something, then I go into that frenzy, right? And then what does the human do? Um, to, to, to me as a dog, the human tries to block. 
I try to I try to subvert the human <laughs> the human holds me right I try yeah I try to struggle right and I continue doing uh, the vocalization mm-hmm. yeah I, to me but what when is I miss- the yeah. command uh, to sit mm. I didn't I just say sit mm-hmm. he just move away yeah exactly because he's got a lot of freedom uh, to move mm-hmm. so so what I've identified in your original structure right now, right, mm-hmm. is that there's a lot of freedom. Number mm-hmm. one, there's a lot of freedom, right? Mm-hmm. Number two, the human is um, chasing after the dog or, or frantic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then there's, that, that means there's no clear communication from you already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though you say sit and all that, there's no clear communication. Right okay. and yeah, actually these two things are enough for for the behavior to go on and on. Mm. So my challenge to you is to transit to a different structure. Okay. Okay. Number one, I want you to practice a little bit of prevention first. So like I talk about the in the second seminar, uh, in the second webinar, I talk about being able to correct your dog uh, before it happens. So mm. if you know that you're taking a delivery, right, mm-hmm. and you know that the delivery time is during such and such. Have your dog on a leash first. That's oh, number one. Okay. 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 That's kind of standard. It's just to prevent you from uh, needing to chase after your dog. Mm-hmm. True, right? True. Yeah. That's number one. Then number two, that's so we eliminate a little bit of that freedom. Mm. Because if your dog is uh, uh, starting to get hyped up when there's somebody at the door, at least you can step on the leash. You don't need to take the leash and, 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 and correct him or anything yet. At least you can step on the leash and he has less space to move. Okay. Number two, we handle the communication. Mm. So communication, what I see is the missing link here is that you're not telling a dog and what is the behavior. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So I want you to move into a structure whereby number one, you're not what you want. I will ask you to pick a, a, a place that is like three or four steps away from the door that your dog can settle down. You can put a bed there for your dog to settle down. You can put maybe a stool there if your dog is small enough to go onto a stool. Mm. right? But basically, it is to tell your dog to do something else other than pacing and then barking at this human. Mm. Right? So, I yeah, that is the structure that I want you to transit to. Mm. Yeah, but, and yeah. this one you need to do slow progression. Uh. You just mm. need to do cold turkey. Yeah, okay. you just make it happen. The next time you take a delivery, make sure that there's a leash on. Right? How, then how, you show the dog you, where you want the dog to be. Yeah, how do and, you... How do you... Yeah, sorry, just, just, to... just for you to finish, right? Okay. When you say sit, right? Huh? Now you have the leash and you can... And I'm, I'm, I'm also asking you to push the dog butt down so that you get sit. Okay. So your dog doesn't have a chance to ignore you. Right okay. now your your dog has a thousand opportunities to ignore you. Mm. Right? Mm. First because there's so much freedom can run away from you. Basically mm. it's slipping around uh, mm. you. Yeah. Mm. And then okay. secondly you are you have not followed through enough. Okay. So remember cold turkey you need 100% follow through. So if the sit is what you want, then you need to get the sit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Can? the thing is, uh, the challenge is to get him to sit on that. Yeah. Killer. Yeah, but you've not tried it. You've not tried it with a leash before. attached. Without leash. the leash. Uh. Without yeah, the you, leash. you've only tried it without the leash. What? Yeah, without the leash. I used yeah. to put the bed near the door, away from the door. Get him to yes. sit feet there. He sat, mm. he ate the treat and he ran. <laughs> Command mm. he ran away. Yeah, <laughs> too soon. You're you're giving you're giving reinforcement or the, the treat or or the praise he, too give soon. Give the command to sit the, then thereafter give treat. <laughs> yes, but don't give the treats too soon. Okay. Right? If you think about it, I'm pretty sure that the dog trainer that you engaged, uh, he or she might have practiced some form of control to prevent your dog from running away. Whether it was he or she placing a physical body, body. Um, yeah, body to block the behavior. But dog trainers, 
usually they use body language effectively enough to not need mm. to use a leash. Yeah. So mm -hmm. therefore, with you, because I can already picture it, the dog mm. is ignoring you. So even if you try to use your body language to block, right, then your, your dog is still doing what uh, you don't want. So mm. the leash, at least you can step on the leash. Okay. Then, and most of the dog is only circling around you. Mm. That, that already eliminates the chance for the dog to ignore you. Okay. 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 Thank I'll you, Lily. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. Yeah. Kimi, do you experience something like that before? All the time. Because, the time. you know, taco can be uh, More. sleeping, <laughs> napping. Then yes. suddenly, right, he's even more alert than me. He will let me know <laughs> when my delivery is at the door, even before the person press the doorbell. Mm. So, but what I did is, um, I try not to open the door. I'll make sure mm -hmm. that he's sit. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if he tries to jump out, I'll just say sit. Or mm -hmm. I will hold him a bit. Then, um, then I open the door. Then he tries to come in. And I'll say, nope, it's not your food. Then he will sit down and look at me. <laughs> yeah, so we try to establish some rules, but not yeah. very successful because I didn't use I didn't use the leash. Yes, that's that's one. And also, um, if you think about it, if you further break it down, I can even do slow progressions for that exercise. So Lily, if you're listening, also there is another way, which is you um, instead of the delivery guy coming. All right you be the one who is, or you or your family members will be the one practicing it with your dog. So you'll be pressing the doorbell, you'll be knocking on the door. Um, okay. Yeah. Because the thing is, a lot of people only um, practice the structure when there's a need for it. Mm -hmm. So on your own, the dog is not doing anything. And um, you don't get to practice that, okay, when I knock, Okay. Like that, you should keep mm -hmm. quiet. When not, you should keep quiet. If you don't do that at home, if you don't correct the behavior, or you stop your dog from correcting that, or uh, from 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 doing that vocalization when he hears the knock, or somebody outside, right? When you are mm -hmm. around, then it's impossible for her or him or her to do the same thing when a stranger is coming into the house or someone else is is ringing the doorbell. Yeah, because the dog will be thinking. Hey, normal days, I've not heard any of this before. And if you haven't practiced with your dog, just by you ringing the doorbell on your own and, and telling your dog to, or interrupting your dog from barking, then your dog's going to think, hey, usual days, I, I, I don't get to practice this. So this is new, mm. I might bark. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes right. it's just, you know, owner lazy lah, but... No yeah, <laughs> yeah, so the owners also will take, also have to be resorting themselves to either slow progression or cold turkey. If you're a procrastinator, go cold turkey. Okay, okay. Yeah. I noted. Okay, guys. Yes. Okay, go. The rest. Another question. Yeah, correct. Next question. Uh, by Max Lim. Uh, in the audience, uh -huh. uh, she has uh she has just uh, adopted a six year old. Male poodle who is very mm -hmm. fearful, uh, anxious mm -hmm. due to previous owner's uh, abusive acts of uh, caging him up most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, banging on metal cage and doors to shut his barking. So he never had a chance to walk the outdoors, uh, which mm -hmm. she has uh, successfully rehabilitated uh, him now with two times mm -hmm. daily walks in the park. Uh, mm -hmm. However, he does not have any other socialization skills with other dogs. He cowers and trembles when others want to sniff him, mm. uh, when out on walks, but does not turn aggressive. Lah. Okay. Uh, so, okay. she would like to have him to be able to be less anxious and perhaps on a transitional level due to his, you know, set yes. past history. Yes. This one, you got to do a, a slow, progressive um, transition. Mm. Although, um, if... Judging from the kind, the level of anxiety that this dog has, right, almost everything uh, that's new to this dog would would appear to be like cold turkey for this dog. So this dog would be like, oh, everything is new. Uh, so even a dog coming close to him or her would be new. Um, and I I would describe the the slow transitions, right, to be um, 
So, okay. I'm also going to tie in with people who have had, who have not allowed their dogs to, to have a lot of in social interactions when they go, um, when, when they're on CB. So what happened during CB is a lot of my clients also, they lacked, uh, because they were all, we were not all, we were all not allowed to go to the dog park swap. Mm -hmm. So during CB period, there was very little uh, dog to dog interactions. Mm -hmm. And some of my clients, as soon as phase two hit, right, they brought their dogs to the dog park. And then knowing that in my second seminar, second webinar, I covered the frustration and the, the boredom bit. So there's mm -hmm. that pent up energy and they're bringing it into the dog park as well. Okay. So a lot of people, they did the cold turkey um, transition, right? So it's almost like a reverse culture shock for the dog. So the dog goes back to the dog park for the first time in like two months and is trying to release all this frustrated and all this boredom. And the dog becomes very intense. Mm -hmm. They might become a bit more rough. Or mm -hmm. dogs who are shyer would be like, um, I've not seen dogs for two months. And now they're coming so close and in my face. Yeah, so that's not ideal. So same for um, the owner of this dog, uh, Max. And yeah. So Max, if you want to introduce your dog to other dogs, right? Then my then stick to my plan for or my rule when I go to dog parks. Firstly, always make sure that your dogs are well exercised before going to the dog park. A lot of people bring their dogs into the dog park to exercise, right? Mm -hmm. It should be a chill out place, ideally a dog park. It should be a place whereby there's friendly, chill play, mm -hmm. um, not overexcited, uh, frustrated play. It's not something. It's not a place that you go to vent. So a lot of uh, owners mistake uh, the, the purpose of the dog park for that. So therefore, in order to decrease your chances of dog entering into a conflict with such or clashing with such dogs, right, then uh, whether it's a head-to-head -head clash or a flight kind of clash, always exercise your dog first before going into the dog park. And then when you enter the dog park, don't straight away take off the leash. A lot of people, they enter the... the, the they, a lot of people, they end one my words are getting tied to my tongue today. So a lot of people, when they enter the dog parks, right, mm -hmm. they like to just give the dog full freedom. So there's no uh, transition into the dog park. So the dog thinks that a dog park represents a whole different set of rules. Mm -hmm. So my advice is exercise your dog first. Then as you bring your dog into the dog park, don't take off the leash first. Walk your dog into the dog park on leash. So that the dog doesn't feel that, hey, this is um, a whole different place mm -hmm. with a whole different set of rules. What I want your dog to feel is that he's going home for a walk, right? He's getting his exercise. He's getting a bit of discipline during the walk and then transit into the dog park smoothly on leash and continue your walk inside the dog park for at least one or two rounds so that the dog eases into it. Now, if you have a nervous dog, all the more you should walk you should do the one whereby you're walking around the dog park. Mm -hmm. At first, you should walk at the peripheral of the dog park, right? Okay. And you should continue walking when the dogs come to sniff. Don't pause. Because when you pause, your dog's motion is disrupted. Mm -hmm. And if your dog is feeling nervous, then that disruption is going to force the dog to, to go into this shutdown, especially when a dog is coming in. Yeah. So, my advice of walking, continuing to walk, even though the dog is coming to sniff, is such that you maintain the energy of your dog, number one. Number two, when you continue walking past when the dog is coming near your dog, you actually force the other dog to go to the back to sniff your dog, not to the front. Now, dog-to-dog -dog interaction, when it is so, uh, when it is too direct, face-to-face, there tends to be a lot of social pressure from the incoming dog into your dog. Mm -hmm. So sometimes your dog might um, flight or if your dog is a bit hardy, your dog might lash up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So continuing motion is very important. Number one, to ensure that they don't see this as a place where it's a different set of rules. Then okay. number two, right, you let 
you you reduce the chances of face to face interactions. And even with face to face interactions, it is um, minimal. So so the dog comes face to face, and then if you continue walking, right, then the dog mm-hmm. has to follow behind in order to sniff or greet your dog. Okay. Yeah. So that's a strategy that I adopt with all dogs, even my own dogs as well. Because I want them to ease into the energy of the dog park. Not um, go into the dog park and like, go, hello, I'm here. And then they disrupt the energy that is already there in the dog park. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, this slow transition works also because then your dog would have been able to um, indirectly meet the other dogs. Mm-hmm. Right, and sometimes if 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 your dog is is new or if your dog is interesting, you'll find a pack of dogs following you. Right, so essentially you might be doing a pack walk. Mm-hmm. Now, if you don't feel confident enough for your dog to go into a dog park and be exposed like this, mm-hmm. then arrange a pack walk with your friends, because side then you can do side by side interaction. It's just walking. So a lot of people think that okay, socialization means playing. But it's not. Socialization just means being okay with being around each other. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't need a dog to be playing. Um, that's a bonus. Because that, uh, the play would mean that they found some, somebody that they are, com- they, are, they are competent with. Okay. Yeah. So right? Like yeah. So, yeah. if... if if you have a dog who, who is, um, for the first time you're bringing to the dog park, you mm. should only off-leash your dog when he's found that competent partner. Mm. Yeah, when they first start playing, then I tell the owners, okay, off-leash, off-leash. Then you're rewarding the dog with freedom at the right time and the right energy. Otherwise, okay. yeah, there's no harm uh, guiding your dog around in the dog park on-leash, right? Okay. Especially when your dog is nervous. You don't want him to practice flight. Because if I off-leash a, a, a nervous dog in a dog park, that dog is going to go into a corner mm-hmm. and not going to move. Yeah. And then the dogs are going to come and be curious, capo, come and sniff him. And then your, your poor little dog will be there telling everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> that's the most extreme case. Okay. Yeah. So that's why motion is very important. Mm. I got a yeah. question. Oh, I hope that uh, helped. Her to yeah. understand. I think yeah. sounds like uh, based on what you're saying, I think Max uh, Poodle just need a bit more time, especially because of his mm. past. Yeah. So if I were to further break it down into trans- smaller progressions, right? Mm. Then I would say don't even go, don't even enter the dog park. Mm. The first day that you go, you walk around the dog park, as in you walk around the park away from the dog park. Then when you reach the dog park, right, you walk mm-hmm. out on the outside. Don't even enter the dog park. So that when you, as you walk along the barrier of the dog park, you can see like a preview of how the other dogs are going to perceive your dogs. So if you walk on the outside of the dog park, behind Mm -hmm. the fence, and dogs are coming in, charging and barking at your dog, then you know that the energy is not competent. Yeah. Competent. And I'm saying it right. Competent. Complimentary. That's That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you want a complementary some uh, energies that can 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 ease in, can they can, can be integrated together well, that complement each other. Yeah. So if you're able to achieve walking outside the dog park and the dogs are coming near the fence and sniffing your dog and they're not barking, they're not trying to like get to your dog, or they're even just ignoring your dog. But all these are positive signs that yes, these dogs they can ease into this energy that you're bringing in. So day three, I'll do the same. Walk around the park, walk around the dog park, and then maybe I'll go in. But I go in, I will walk on the inside first. Then I'll, I'll come up. Okay. Yeah. That's just to give your dog also a sneak peek of what is uh, on the other side. Okay. Yeah. A question. We're talking about slow progressions. Like. Okay, uh- yes. Go ahead, Kimmy. Um, what is your take, right? Uh, or, or what's your opinion on um, day home for dogs? You know, they care, uh, they care. Like, yes. uh, you leave yes. them over there yes. at uh for like couple of hours, and yes. 
you know, some daycare centers do allow dogs to mingle around. Yes. But of course, those daycares, they go through pretty strict um, um, yes. examinations. So you need to go through, like, you know, takes check and things like that. You need to uh, give your your uh, annual checks then before you can. Then, uh, I don't know, maybe you your your center also does. Do mm. you do daycare as well? So, yeah, I do is- daycare as well. Um, but to be honest, I'm uh, looking at the standards out there, right? Mm. Um, a lot of my clients' dogs have negative experiences in a lot of daycares. Um, because number one, they come to me for training. And number two, um, I take them in. I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about those dogs that are banned or rejected from other daycares. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's just a misunderstanding. Yeah. So the thing is, a lot of people, so there, there, there are two, two sides to the story. Uh, mm-hmm. One is from the person that runs the daycare, right? Mm-hmm. So they advertise their daycares to be, um, come, let your dogs play, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a play school. Yeah, I call it a play school. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they expect the dogs to be, you know, mingling with each other and playing a lot. So mm-hmm. owners will also have that expectation where if I were to bring my dog into that daycare, right? They mm-hmm. should be playing. But when you have that intention, right? Mm-hmm. You are actually combining a lot of excitable happy-go-lucky, excitable, uh, playful dogs. Yeah. So there are chances in which the dogs might be too rowdy. So yeah. if I were an owner and I, I first adopted a dog, I don't know my dog that well. I sent to a daycare and it happens to be my dog is a bit shy. Then my dog is going to be very overwhelmed with the excitable, uh, playful energy because it's too much social pressure. For the dog. Especially yeah. it's such a confined place, right? Correct. Correct. It's worse than so, a dog. Correct. And okay. so so I and I've also trained daycare personnel uh, from other daycares. And I tell them that the, the one thing that you should bear in mind is to be able to manage different energies and regulate the energy of your daycare. Because it is not about changing the energy level in in that vicinity. Yeah. So in my daycare, I I manage them in a way whereby I always exercise them first. They go out mm-hmm. for a pack walk together. So that they are okay side by side. Before okay. I even let them into the indoor area. And when I let them into the indoor area, firstly, they will have to be let loose one by one. And I'll let loose the, the calmest one first. Okay. Right? Then after that, the, the few uh, playful ones. Before okay. I let loose those who might be fearful or those who might go into ever, over-excitement or aggression. That so if I maintain, should be the last one. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm maintaining like this, right, okay. then chances for clashes will be much less. Okay. Yeah. And I don't have the expectation whereby playing is good because sometimes playing leads to disagreements, right? Because they're using the mouth on each other, they're wrestling and stuff. So that um, increases the chances for, for, for clashes. So in my daycare, is usually to promote calmness first before mm-hmm. playfulness. Yeah, okay. and dogs who are not that sociable, sometimes I'll put them on a leash and I'll attach them to me so that when I move, they are also moving. And I, I, I already mentioned the importance of, of movement, right? It creates curiosity in other dogs and it also keeps your dog uh, moving and not shut down like that. Okay. Yeah. So sending to a daycare is actually a good way to expose your dog to it, provided that the people who are running the daycare uh, know full well the character of your dog. And it's not a matter of going through the, the temperament assessment because a lot of daycares have this, right? They, they, they say, oh, this is your first time? Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll need to assess your dog. So they bring in the dog, right? And that dog sometimes is not the perfect candidate. And that dog might not be uh, a dog that will complement your dog. Mm-hmm. So if you have a shy dog and I bring out a very playful dog, right? Okay. Your dog might get so stressed that it might snap at my dog. Okay. And then fail the temperament assessment. Mm. So, sorry, mm. you can't come to my daycare. Like that. 
So that's very unfair because you're only judged on one interaction or two interactions at best. Or it could be judged at the wrong time because firstly, that place itself is already new. Okay. When you bring your dog all down for assessment. Yeah. So for, for my daycare, I don't do any assessments uh, yeah. because I take in all kinds of dogs and I believe that there's always some kind of benefit regardless of whether you're looking for your dog to play in the daycare or just be exposed to, to, to more dogs. Okay. Right? Because okay. in my daycare, we do a lot of group walks as well as group interactions. Now, okay. um, if, if a lot of people, they, they only look at the, the, the play as, as the, the bonus, right? Then I would just tell them to play with your dog because ultimately you want your dog um, the, the, the play drive to be channeled towards you because it creates engagement with the owner. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I see. Right? Because if you, if you only go to daycare to play with other dogs, then when he, your dog sees other dogs on the streets, he's only going to think of playing. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Just mm. one quick question. Kai, do I have? Or oh, actually, there are some people. Because I just wanted to know yeah. that... Um, how do you distinguish your dog? Is he being very sociable or he's at stress towards other dogs? Because mm -hmm. we, we can only see it through the tail. You know, they say that, you know, oh, if he wags the tail, oh. he's fine. Yeah. So, but um, how do we know? Is he under stress or is he just being very playful, very sociable? Okay. So, um, how do you judge though? A or little is bit of uh, yeah. corrections uh, to... to the, the people who describe uh, mm. that. So mm. a lot of people, they read and then they yeah. see, oh, okay, the, the ears are floppy, means it's okay. Uh, the tail is upright, means it's not good. Or the, the yeah. wagging is good. Yeah? Right? Uh -huh. So the mistake when you absorb information like this, right, mm -hmm. is that you're localizing a lot of the body language. Yeah. So you're only isolating the tail, you're isolating only the ears, you're isolating something else, mm. right? I'll give you a funny example. When I was young, right, uh, also like, I wanted to know how, how to uh, interact with girls, how to talk to girls. What are positive signs when you talk to a girl, right? <laughs> so I read this, oh, if the girl is twir twirling the hair, it means that the girl is <laughs> interested in you, right? But after I married my wife, I found out that they, they twirl the hair all the time. <laughs> so how can that be a clear indication so yeah I was I was naive I was young to believe that that is a positive sign uh, of a girl who's being attracted in me no so likewise for dogs now I tell owners don't just look at the ears and the, and the, the tail, and the tail mm -hmm. right when you look at the dog it's yeah. a it's a lot of information right the main thing that you should look at is how is the dog holding the body? Is the ho dog holding the body stiff, right? Or is the dog holding the body loose? Okay. Because when, there's, when, it's, when it's stiff, there's tension. So okay. when there's tension, you will see the signs that they say, the erect ears, the erect okay. tail. Okay. Yeah? And then the heckles come up. Yeah. Okay. All these will definitely be present. But sometimes they are so subtle. Right? And like Shiba Inus, they hold their tails high most of the time. Does that mean that they are constantly tense? No. Okay. Yeah, so you have to look at the energy of the dog, right? Look at yourself in the mirror too. Like when you're angry, right? Nothing much moves. Okay. Yeah, but when you're, when you're relaxed, you know, you're, you're more flowy. Mm. Yeah. So, and the, the, the body movement is smooth as well. Of mm. course, those isolated uh, ways of looking at body language can indicate certain things, but it can also open up a room uh, for confusion because when a dog is overexcited, right, and playing, and that playing turns into biting, mm -hmm. the tail might still be wagging. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Right? So mm. the only thing that I from my experience, I always try to put myself in the dog's shoes. So when I was first doing dog training, right, I was not very good at reading uh, dog body language, canine body language, because the, I, I also did what you guys did, right? Read, wah. So then, then what if the ears erect but the tail is down? Like, what does that mean, man? 
like the dog is half half, right? <laughs> so, so I, I I don't do that anymore. Whereas you look at the body language of the dog. I'm gonna try to imitate for you guys if you can see, right? Okay. So, so a dog that is that is excited usually, right, or alert, okay. right? Usually the body weight mm-hmm. is forwards, forwards Ooh. like that. Okay. Yeah, you see. And the ears are naturally erect. Okay. Yeah. Right? So I copy the dog's energy or the dog's body language and I and I try to stand like that. Lah. Like, can I be relaxed when I'm doing this? No, right? Oh, well, my neck's so long. Lah. But yeah, <laughs> there's no way that I'll be playful when I'm doing this. It's very okay. difficult. Yeah? Okay. When I'm playful, I have to be, you know, a bit more like loose. Mm. Yeah. So okay. put yourself the number one. Uh, tip that I use, right, is put yourself in the dog's uh, body language. So if the bo- dog's body language is imitate everything, including the mouth. So the dog is relaxed. Okay. Soft eyes, soft eyes. Open <laughs> mouth, right? Tongue out. It's okay. what you always know. But what if it changes subtly? Oh. Stop breathing. <laughs> but eyes too soft. Okay. Right? How do you feel? Hmm. Yeah, those of you at home, do this exercise with me, right? <laughs> do this. Then you feel the muscles. Right? right? So so you actually have a rhythm that mm-hmm. is quite relaxed. Mm-hmm. Almost like you're rocking to a baby, uh, baby's rhythm, right? Mm-hmm. So copy this and then go from to and stop rocking. Okay. Yeah. Are you as relaxed as before? No. Okay. It might be you watching TV. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? Okay. But from a dog's perspective, then right, this is a, quite a big change from mm-hmm. to this. And then from this, pull your head back. And expose your double chin. Okay. And pull your head back. So this is very typical of a dog that is uncomfortable already. So they'll uh-huh. close their mouths and then the eyes start to so you, you read a lot, the eyes dilate, the pupils dilate. So it's practically just the dog doing this. Okay. Yeah. Giving you the side eye. Right? Uh-huh. Okay. So what kind of what kind of feeling do you have when you when you do this body language with me? Okay. Yeah. You feel yeah. And notice that everything tenses up. You have to tense up in order for you to do this. Okay. There's no way you can stay relaxed. Makes sense. Mm. Right? So copy your dog's energy or just try to put yourself in that dog. Um, the, if the dog is doing this like sideways, yeah, that means what? Suspicious or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if the dog is sideways and then doing this, right? Oh, okay. Doing this, yeah. This is what? I'm avoiding eye contact from the dog and I'm but, showing my, and uh, I'm wriggling. <laughs> I'm wriggling. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so that's playful. But if the wriggle goes into a soft wriggle, no more wriggle, and the no longer stop. Okay. Yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Okay. Because they can switch. And if you look at changes in certain um, isolated parts, body parts, then it's very difficult for you to catch on. You're, you're going to be one step slower than your dog. Okay. Yeah. But of course, all this also comes with experience, you know. Um, and every single dog is different okay. in showing, right? Some might show it a lot in the tail, some might show it more in the butt, but the tail doesn't really wave much, but the butt, yeah. Oh, especially like uh, short tails, uh, those with short tails, pups, uh, Frenchies, they don't have, some even have their tails docked. Okay. So how, what do you look for? You look for the body movement of the like butt. Corgi. Yeah, mm-hmm. or your corgi. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Right? So I always see. identify the energy of the dog. Energy and- is your inroad to, to canine body language. Mm. Not so much. If you want to be an expert in canine body language, like a, a Are you- or like people that, that read people's minds. Yeah. Those people are experts at reading body language. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's just right? that. I- yeah. Sorry? So it's just as a dog owner, you know, when you, mm-hmm. when you walk the dog and you want mm-hmm. him to interact with other dogs, but he yes. gets so hyper 
Like, mm. you know, they play around that. I have to watch him, like, you know, okay, will he overly mm. hyper and then, you know, get mm. into some aggression? But I think, like, what you said, um, the owner should be the one that knowing the dog better. So you will know yeah. when when to actually hold him. So this is always yeah. a concern because my dog, if the other dog reacts, he's yeah. okay. He will play, he will play. But if mm. the other dog doesn't want to play, he gets mm. very angry. He will start yes. barking and growling at the other dog. Uh, yeah, so that's where you have to step in. And okay. you yourself, when you when you talk about, when you relate that story with me, right? Mm-hmm. You yourself also feel that, hey, something is off. Yeah. Or something is not matching. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So yeah. why do we do uh, all these uh, interventions and corrections? Because something is not, not clicking. So yeah. when you feel that something is off, right? Energy-wise... Mm-hmm it is telling you already there needs to be something to, to be done. Yeah. Whether it's with regards to the dog or with the human. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Right? Okay. So either you have to settle the dog or you have to bring your dog further away first. Okay. Yeah. Owner cannot lazy lah. One thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't live in... Our dogs don't live in a dog's world. Our dogs live in a human world. Our- so therefore, the humans have to... Um, take up the responsibility and lead our dogs, guide our dogs. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Unless we live in a dog world, then yeah, we follow them. Uh. <laughs> then we let them be our uh, uh, guide, our mentor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, mm-hmm. guys, do we have any more questions? Yes. Or they yes. actually? Yeah. Uh, I think this is actually more uh, quite, quite, quite related to what Ethan actually un- uh, mm-hmm. answered previously already uh, it, it's mm-hmm. on uh, dogs uh, excitement it's uh, by mm-hmm. Weenies and and uh, Eileen who are still in our mm-hmm. uh, audience uh, mm-hmm. so you may actually just you know give a bit more input see uh, wherever relevant uh, so Weenies a dog very easy to get excited and and, and, and the dog barks when when uh, he gets excited yeah and uh, Eileen actually asked how to handle a dog when you know uh, he always lunge and bark at other side of dogs mm-hmm. I think it's very related to what you mm. yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, the again, I will question the structure. Um, mm. Do they allow the dog to go too near to the trigger? Mm. Um, have they practiced enough of uh, social ignoring a- ignorance, meaning that you walk past but don't play? So this might be a dog that has had too many opportunities to. Meet a dog and play. Meet a dog and play. So it's almost like they have cultivated a habit in this dog that every dog that you meet, right, play. Or that dog happens to have that mindset. Right? Mm-hmm. Because uh, in the past, they've not stopped the dog from playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So having said that, right, they should focus on being able to, uh, number one, walk past other dogs without playing. That's your mm-hmm. first challenge. Phase one. <laughs> Yeah, before you even want your dog to calm down in face-to-face with another dog, they should master being able to walk past other dog. Or they should be able to master going to the dog park and walking one round and coming out without the dog complaining, Ayo. which is where the barking and the whining comes up from. Okay. So if your dog is really doing all the barking and whining and trying to lunge to the other dog to play, right? Mm-hmm. Number one, you have not uh, established the skill or the ability from your dog to be able to walk past another dog calmly. Now, where if you want to practice walking past another dog, you can't place them too close together. Okay. So a good idea would be probably going to um, botanical gardens, right? Whereby mm. there's the, the pathways are wider. Okay. Right? And then you, you, you go to a, a further out, outer lane to walk past other dog owners. Okay. Yeah. Your, your first attempt, like I said also, your first attempt when you go into botanical gardens to try to do this exercise. Say like, okay, Ethan said to walk, train to walk past other dogs. So you go yeah. to botanical gardens, then you're very excited, then you walk past. It's going to be a horrible day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> day one is always horrible. Yeah. Because oh. that, is, that is stage one of your slow progression. I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm introducing a slow progressive uh, approach. Okay. Cold turkey, very easy. Just, just do a pack walk. Mm. Oh, you sent to me, uh, I have you do a pet walk with the dog. <laughs> yeah, but let's talk about slow progressions, right? Because mm-hmm. this one, uh, we, uh, when, I'm, when I'm coaching uh, offline like this, right? 
or rather online like this and I'm away from the owner, uh, I have to give them an idea of what slow progression will look like. So far first. Yeah. Okay. And then try to walk head on with, with dogs like this. Okay. Yeah. So that there's an end point. The dog gets excited. And then after that, you, you pass by the other dog. The dog gets excited. Then you can still continue going on. Okay. Yeah. That's stage one. Walk until he has had enough practice, right? Or if it's really too tough for you, you bring the dog out for a run first or walk uh, with no dogs. Then mm-hmm. after that, you, you drive the dog to, or you walk to botanical gardens and then you walk past other dogs. You'll find okay. that you have an easier time. Okay. Yeah. Then practice that first, enough first. So that which, is, which is almost like uh, you're, you're making the dog withdraw from, from the, the trigger, the high of seeing another dog and playing with the other dog. Yeah. yeah. Because he needs to tone it down. Right? Mm. This is a case whereby uh, even though you enjoy it, you shouldn't be doing it all the time. Like, mm. even if you like to drink, you shouldn't be an alcoholic. So okay. you're telling your dog that. Right? Okay. So you're practicing a bit of uh, just being sober. Right? Walking past another dog. Then, okay. next time, the next stage, phase three or phase two, phase three, the next phase would be walking like this and hopefully being able to walk side by side with another dog. Wow. Okay. Side by side. Yeah. Okay. These are all slow progressions. Huh? So side by side with another dog. And then we go. Without playing. Yeah, without yeah. playing. So Just the walk. nearer you are, the more difficult it is to control. Mm-hmm. The further you are, the easier it is. But at all times, also remember that you should have, you should determine the structure. Don't because you see, oh, they play already, play already, then you give up. Then you let them play. Okay. Yeah. Right? So that's why the human still needs to work. Right? If you okay. still encounter a lot of problems when they're this far apart, then maybe it's something you got to do with your leash. You might be giving your dog still too much freedom, too much leeway mm-hmm. for him to get excited. Okay. okay. Okay? Then from then on, yeah. Because if you can get to this stage where you can meet another dog and then you continue walking past, right? Chances are that when you meet another dog, the dog will start to focus on you more instead of focus on the other one. Because okay. then your dog will be asking, okay, are we, are we playing with this dog or are we just walking? Because okay. for the past one month, we've been walking past dogs. <laughs> yeah? So okay. then, yeah. Then when the dogs are nicely walking, find a good place, a place that is safe for them, then you let them interact. Mm. That would be how I would slowly transition. Okay. Right? But if I was to do cold turkey, right? <laughs> then I would have to um, take charge of the other dogs also. Okay. So when I meet the other dog, assuming that the dog is okay, right? I will take the leash of the other dog and I'll bring them for a walk. Mm-hmm. If they get excited, I'll correct on the spot by tugging the leash. Okay. Yeah. When I move, right? Chances are they will move together with me. They might try to play, 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 but because I, the, the movement is constant, they will move. Okay. Yeah. Then mm. from cold, because that's cold turkey, then I have to work backwards. So what if I want to meet, but I don't bring them for a pet walk? Yeah. Wow. So I would have, I would develop a routine whereby I meet the other dog, I see the other dog, we go close enough, the dog gets excited, I move for me. away. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll try it again. How near? Challenge yourself. How near can you go towards the dog without your dog playing? Mm-hmm. Or without your dog getting overexcited? Very difficult. Yeah. Then I'll go. <laughs> okay. It has to be like the, the you say it's difficult because you keep thinking of day one. Day one whereby you make the transition or day one whereby you make the change or you change the habit for your dog. You always think about that. And then that makes you reluctant to even do it. Mm. So a lot of people, yeah, they 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 see it uh, like there's too much work. Yeah. So that's why I go cold turkey for some of my clients, whereas the others I can do slow progressions mm. because I know that they'll do the homework. For example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I cannot when I cannot handle, but maybe because yeah. the taco is small enough that. If he turns too aggressive, like you know, going so much wanting to go to other dog, I will just mm. pick him up and carry him away. 
Ah, so yeah, the picking up that yeah, means you are so, you are you are stopping him okay. even when he has not completed the task. Yeah, because yeah. he just he just talks so hard, so mm-hmm. hard until that he he's almost like you know choking mm-hmm. himself and he start coughing and then he is still doing that. Then I make him sit and and you know oh, but of course the other party was like you know taken a step back. So mm-hmm. I would just pick him up. And carry him away, go to the other side, make him sit down, and then calm down. Then we continue our walk. So okay. that's what I do. Yeah, but okay. probably that's not. When you pick bad. him up, when you pick him up, ask whether you you should always um you should always ask the human whether they are okay to help you, uh, or okay to um yeah basically help you with the training of your dog. And okay. the thing is, I think a lot of dog owners are very helpful. It's not like mm. cat owners. <laughs> but <laughs> we're talking about yeah, my experience. Uh, dog owners usually, yeah. If you lose a dog, dog owners will help you find a dog. Yeah. If you if you need help with calming your dog down, I find that most of the time when you ask, they will help you. They will stay there and they wait for your dog to calm down. So okay. I think you should have asked the owner, "Are you okay if we?" If you help me for a bit, because I just want to teach my dog not to be so excited. I don't want my dog to be over excited. I don't want my dog to be aggressive. I just want to give my dog some exposure. So is it okay if we walk side by side together? Okay. Yeah. Or okay. is it okay if I follow you where wherever you're going? Um, of course not in a creepy way, but yeah. you know, follow you um walking around uh, this park for at least a few hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah. Treat as you ask. Don't yeah. end the exercise then then where your dog is displaying the behavior and then you you don't allow the dog to, to settle down. You didn't. Yeah. 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 So you have to understand dogs they will settle down after a while. It's just how long you wait. Okay. If you watch yeah, TV shows, obviously it looks like magic. If you watch um yeah. You, basically if you just watch movies and TV, yeah. Everything looks magic because a lot of work goes on behind the scenes. The scenes. Mm. Okay. Which is the, the truth about dog training. A lot of people want to control their dogs like remote mm-hmm. control. Yeah. But okay. they have to actually do the work to associate, to pair the remote or the sound, okay. the, the command to the behavior first. Yeah, for sure. Mm. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot, a lot of times people are not doing a lot of uh, enough practice on, and then they give up too easily mm. yep for sure for sure okay yep. cool Ethan yes. uh, alright I think with time flying like that that, really, <laughs> that wraps up our finale I think <laughs> okay. the sessions are really every every two weeks or so quite, quite, quite short to even you know have all the yeah. but I think Ethan you've definitely given you know so much to learn and put into practice for our dogs mm. Yeah, but um, for me, maybe more like future pointers as an aspiring dog owner. But definitely for all the participants who have been with us, I think it's been very valuable for them. Okay. How are uh, they? Are they so still much. alive? Have they, yeah. Have they, like, yeah, they are still quite... Actually, pretty much everyone are still alive. So, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much okay. everyone is still That's alive. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, A yeah. big shout out to everyone, yeah, uh, in the every single one of the audience. As well as to those people who are going to view this uh, at a later day or date, um, mm-hmm. thank you for bearing with us. And and yeah, I hope that some of the questions, even though it's not your questions, that some of the answers have have some applicability to you. Um, and yeah, the bottom line is dog training never stops, and it's it's. I'm not sure whether I mentioned it before, but it's pretty much like taking a diet. The moment you stop eating healthy food, you will see different changes in your body. So the moment you slack in your relationship with your dog, um, you're not giving enough structure, you're not giving enough discipline, or even some people are not giving enough attention or love, then you will see um, leaks in your relationship. Um, And it has become evident during the CB period. Not only humans are expressing, uh, are experiencing a bit of conflict within themselves, but also uh, us and our dogs right so yeah I also really want to give my uh, heartfelt uh, thanks to uh, Workwell as well as Jasko for partnering 
me, Ethan from Urban K9. So thank you all for your trust and your support um, in de okay. delivering this well, three series webinar. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, uh, it's been really amazing. Thank you yep. so much again, yeah. Ethan. Yes. And we look forward to more, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. You. Uh, you guys out there, you all, you know, for all your questions, they really yeah. mean a lot. You know, help all of yes. us. You know, to to make this uh webinar with Ethan a very engaging one. So really, thank you all. Yes. Uh, I'm just gonna, as usual, uh, flip up this screen. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you know, if you all enjoyed this series and would like to be kept in the loop of uh, you know, future webinars like this one, please uh, spend a minute to just scan the QR code, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, so that we can actually know <laughs> inform you lah, and then okay. our pitch. So yeah. it would also mean uh, a lot to us if you could actually just leave a feedback, right? Uh, so that we can yeah. actually improve the quality of our webinars. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much everyone. Uh, enjoy you. your uh, long, the remaining of your, you know, long weekend. All right, yes. we'll see you again in the future. Yay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay.